Hello, my name is Courtney Gilmore Wilson, and I am the Associate Director of Pharmacotherapy for the Mountain Area Health Education Center in Asheville, North Carolina. I also work as an Assistant Professor of Clinical Education at the UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy. I first became involved in treating patients with opioid use disorder in 2015 when we recognized this need with our own patients at Mayhek. There was, and frankly still is, a dearth of treatment options in our region. We sadly lost one patient to an overdose after she had asked us for help, but we couldn't connect her to treatment. This was our impetus to begin learning about and providing treatment for opioid use disorder within primary care. In 2015, I developed Mayhex office-based opioid treatment program, which I now direct. We currently have close to 30 providers and have treated over 100 patients with opioid use disorder. In the next 15 minutes, I hope you gain a better understanding of the brain changes involved in opioid use disorder, that you can describe the three medications approved to treat this disease, and are able to select the best option for a patient based on his or her specific characteristics. Opioid use disorder is a chronic relapsing brain disease. There's a significant amount of stigma associated with this disease process. Unfortunately, many of the behaviors that lead to the stigma are a result of the pathophysiological changes in the brain that cause this disease. I'll provide a cursory overview of this today, but ultimately it's important to understand that with repeated use of a substance, the brain changes and results in cravings and compulsive use of a substance despite negative consequences. Dopamine is the primary neurotransmitter involved with substance use disorders. When dopamine is released, it activates our reward system, causing that feel-good feeling and reinforcing the behavior that triggered the release. Dopamine drives all of our behaviors that are necessary for survival, such as eating, bonding, and procreating. Where we get into trouble is when we, with drugs or with other things not necessary for survival, stimulate the release of dopamine. All of us have a baseline level of dopamine. Now remember that feeling you had when you fell in love, had the best sex of your life, or had an amazing meal. On your best day, this is how much dopamine you will have in your brain. Now, compare that to heroin, marijuana, and cocaine, and you can see how impactful that surge of dopamine can be to someone. Dopamine levels that high can cause harm, so with repeated use, the body naturally downregulates its endogenous levels, resulting in a dopamine deficiency. So individuals with a substance use disorder have significantly lower amounts of endogenous dopamine. Their baseline is now much lower than someone without this disease and lower than his or her original baseline level. This deficiency leads to the behaviors that characterize addiction, including lack of motivation, apathy, cravings, and eventually those desperate measures that people will go to in order to get the drug. Medication-assisted treatment indirectly restores dopamine levels back to baseline, which then allows the patient to function and focus on recovery. This is similar to the treatment paradigm for diabetes. We treat blood sugars with insulin, metformin, and other drugs so that the patient can focus on lifestyle changes such as diet and activity. MAT is a standard of care for patients with opioid use disorder. We know that abstinence-only programs will work for a select few individuals, but ultimately it has a 90% relapse rate. This is compared to a 40 to 60% relapse rate with MAT, which is comparable to other chronic disease states, including diabetes. The goals of medication-assisted treatment include blocking cravings, managing withdrawal symptoms, decreasing illicit use, and helping to maintain recovery. There are three FDA-approved medications for opioid use disorder. Methadone, which is a full agonist, buprenorphine, which is a partial agonist, and naltrexone, which is an antagonist. Methadone is a full opioid agonist, meaning that it binds to and fully engages the opioid receptor. While we know that it is very effective for the treatment of opioid use disorder, it is also more dangerous, particularly during induction, than other options because of its long and variable half-life. 
It is lethal in overdose, both due to respiratory depression and the potential for QT prolongation. Because of this, it is limited to use in opioid treatment programs that are highly regulated by SAMHSA. You can see that the dose ranges are significantly higher than what we see for the treatment of chronic pain. In Western North Carolina, we generally see average doses in the 90s to low 100s. Treatment with methadone requires daily observed dosing. For many of our patients, this means waiting in line at 5 o'clock in the morning to get their dose. Now, think of your morning routine and how challenging that could be, especially if you had transportation barriers, limited work flexibility, or childcare demands. I know that I would really struggle and I have a flexible job, a supportive partner, and reliable transportation. While necessary, daily dosing really can be a barrier for many patients. Patients who generally need methadone are those who need that highly structured environment of observed daily dosing in order to support their recovery. Also those who have a long history of opioid use disorder or have used for very high doses generally are heroin patients tend to do better on methadone because they have such a high opioid debt. Buprenorphine is a partial opioid agonist, meaning that it engages the opioid receptor but doesn't turn it fully on. Because of this, it is much safer in that there is a significantly lower risk of death with overdose. The case reports we have of lethal overdose with buprenorphine are when the patient mixed it with alcohol or a benzodiazepine. Another important aspect to its kinetics is that it has a very high affinity to and very slow dissociation from the opioid receptor. This means that buprenorphine will displace anything else from the opioid receptor and will remain on the receptor for a long period of time, thus resulting in its long half-life. Because of these characteristics, buprenorphine can be tricky to start. The patient needs to be in mild to moderate withdrawal before beginning therapy to prevent precipitated withdrawal. If someone takes buprenorphine while the opioid receptors are fully engaged with a full agonist, buprenorphine will displace the agonist but only partially engage the receptor. This causes a precipitated withdrawal, which can be very immediate and very miserable for the patient. Importantly, buprenorphine is not absorbed orally, so it's formulated as a sublingual or a buccal administration. There's also a new implant and a new injection to the market, but for many reasons we are not seeing these in practice yet. Most experts prefer buprenorphine over methadone because of its safety profile and easier accessibility. In general, it's best for patients with mild to moderate opioid use disorder who don't have a high opioid debt. Prescribers must have their DEAX license, which requires eight hours of training for MDs and 24 hours of training for NPs and PAs. Once they have this license, then buprenorphine can be prescribed in the office-based setting, such as family medicine, OB-GYN, or psychiatry practices. There are limits to the number of patients for whom each provider may prescribe. In the first year, that limit is 30 patients, but it can be increased to 100 after one year and then 270 patients if there is a demonstrated need. At this time, per federal regulations, only physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants can prescribe buprenorphine. The administration of buprenorphine can be tricky, so this is an important piece of education for the patient. The patient must avoid smoking, eating, drinking, or brushing his or her teeth for 15 minutes prior to administration. Then he or she must place the tablet or film under the tongue or in the cheek based on the product and sit quietly for 5 to 10 minutes while it dissolves. Afterwards, he or she will spit out any remaining tablet or film. Patients can generally do two tablets or films at once but it does get harder to do with more than two. The information in the package insert says not to cut the film, but we often see this in practice. There is an important distinction between the two formulations, the mono product and the combination product. The combination product, which contains buprenorphine and naloxone, and branded as Suboxone, Bunivil, and Subsolve, is the preferred agent. The naloxone is an abuse deterrent. 
Because naloxone is not absorbed orally, sublingually, or buccally, the patient is not exposed to this opioid antagonist when taken as directed. However, if the patient injects the product, then the naloxone will be absorbed. In that case, it will eliminate or dramatically blunt the effect of the buprenorphine. The mono product, which is just buprenorphine and is branded as Subutex, really should be avoided in most situations. There is a much higher street value for this product, so it is more likely to be diverted. There are rare occasions when we will use the mono product, and that is generally when the patient is cash pay and I can't get them on a patient assistance program for some reason. This is because the mono product is much cheaper than the combination product. Although guidelines say it should be used in pregnancy, our OB colleagues also prefer the combination product. Because the naloxone is not absorbed, there's minimal to no risk to the fetus, thus making the combination product a safer option. A few pearls to consider. Because of its slow dissociation from the receptor, it has a very long half-life. This means it can be dosed every other day to even every three days for opioid use disorder. Some patients, however, prefer split daily dosing. This can be good for patients with chronic pain since the analgesic effect is only six to eight hours long. For most patients, four milligrams a day is enough to block withdrawal symptoms and up to 16 milligrams per day is required to block cravings. The max dose is between 24 to 32 milligrams per day. The final medication is naltrexone, an opioid antagonist, which is indicated for both alcohol and opioid use disorders. Because it's an antagonist, there is no abuse potential and is not controlled, and there are no prescribing limitations to it. It will precipitate withdrawal if the patient is taking an opioid, so he or she must abstain for a period of time prior to starting the naltrexone. Naltrexone is available in both a long-acting injection and a short-acting pill. Most experts agree that agonists are preferred over antagonists, mainly because there are very high dropout rates with naltrexone. There is a niche for naltrexone for patients who are highly motivated and don't want to be on an agonist, those who can't be on an agonist, such as pilots, and those who have been very successful on methadone or buprenorphine and wish to stop agonist therapy but want some additional protection against relapse. In summary, MAT restores dopamine levels in the brain so that the patient can focus on recovery. Methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone are all approved for medication-assisted treatment. However, buprenorphine is a safer and more easily accessible treatment option, which makes it an ideal agent for many patients. Thank you.